everyone. Welcome to our seminar. Do you know clearly how gas sensors work? And how to apply the knowledge of advanced material chemistry to build up effective gas sensors? Today, we will soon learn more in depth from our speaker. So, we have here now, Professor Jian Jin Oh, who is the Director of Advanced Electronics and Sensors, School of Engineering, RMIT University, Australia, and the Director of Joint Laboratory of Nanoscale Functional Materials and Sensing, School of Material Science and Engineering, Southwest Jiaodong University, China. Our speaker has had a distinguished career in materials and sensors. Our speaker, Professor Jian Jin, has great depth of experience in this field of gas sensors because he has over 130 peer-reviewed publications in top journals, including Nature Materials, Nature Communications, Advanced Materials, ACS Nano, etc. With over 13,000 citations and an H index of 59, Professor O is currently holding four international patents on human gas sensing capsule and has been the scientific advisor for RMIT spin-off company Otmo Biosciences LTD since 2019. His research interests include two-dimensional materials, chemical and biological sensing, nanoscale electronics, and artificial intelligence-driven sensors. Professor Jinjin got several prestigious awards, such as Victoria Fellow, Malcolm Moore Industry Award by RMIT, Discovery ECR Award by the Australian Research Council, and many more. So, he was also selected as the top emerging leader in engineering and computer science by the Australian Research Magazine in both 2018 and 2019. Let's follow his talk now. Gas Detection, Applications of Knowledge in Chemistry to Environmental Problems. Try to feedback into the uh, the manufacturer of the vehicle, or try to you know get in a significant in indication to the government authorities or even um, the the peoples. And also, some of the really nice um, application is about the food qualities. You know, it, this is a recent emerging field about how to use a gas sensor to monitor the food the food quality. For instance, if the food become a bit spoiled or the quality is lowering. It's gonna be em emitted some of the nitrogen contained organic compounds. And if we can significant accurately and significant monitoring this kind of the, uh, the vapors, we can actually, we can have a um, non-invasive and you know, a um, long distance monitoring of the uh, frequencies. And also um, the medical diagnosis, because for instance, if we breath, you can smell something that possibly is unusual by the nose, but we don't know what it is. So the gas sensor is here to actually to estimate the composition of the, um, the gas from the, uh, from the exhaust breath of the human being. And also some of the interesting is about the far from the human being. And you know, particularly if you die, if you having a special diet and you know, you're getting a very smelly far. This is actually, this is some indication of, the, of your health state of your gut. So by monitoring this, this kind of gas, which haven't been imagined before, we can actually can correlate those of the gas composition and concentration with the health state of the human being. So you can see it, it covered the whole range of the um, industry productions and the transportation and the everyday life from the gas sensors. So um, it, it's, it's, it's no wonder that the, the use of the gas sensors actually in the actual market between 2015 to 2021, you have the annual growth rate of around 38% um, annually. So now I'm gonna give you a very brief um, introduction about the gas sensors. Yeah, because gas sensors, actually speaking, it's not a single element that, um, that cover all the aspects of the gas sensors. Because the gas sensor is a huge market and it's a huge research area. There's a lot of approach to detect the gas using the physical properties and also the chemical reactions. So I give you some of the examples here, you know, for instance, physical properties. So for instance, we use the, uh, the gas optical absorption properties or the thermal conductivity property of the gas molecule 
all the acoustic absorption, all the photoacoustic absorptions, these kind of things that without enrollment of the chemical reactions to try to, you know, for instance, getting the features of the, um, the optical intensity or the temperature change to try to correlate between the sensor output with the gas concentrations. And another big area is about, we use the material as a catalyst to try to stimulate the chemical reaction with the target molecules. And from the catalytic um, output, we're gonna detect, for instance, the current change or the resistance change or the voltage change. So this is all about the chemical reaction-based gas sensors. And this is also very popular as well. It's in the equal balance position with the physical properties-based gas sensors. So some of the you know, very um, common one is uh, electrochemical uh, gas sensors, which is based on the amperometric um, detections. And also we have the catalytic combustions at very high temperatures. And the final one yeah, is a semiconductor um, sensor that use a semiconductor as a catalyst at a slightly lower, at, uh, lower temperatures to try to stimulate the catalytic interaction between the gas molecules and the materials. So now I'm gonna give you some of the typical examples and the fundamental about each category. And also their advantage and disadvantage, definitely. Okay, first thing first, I would like to talk about the optical gas sensors because this is a really general category that used in the sensor market at this moment. So optical gas sensors, as I mentioned before, is belong to the category of the physical properties. They, they use the, 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 uh, the physical property of the gas to try to uh, uh, induce the detections. And because optical gas sensors is, um, is a very general category, right? So now I only introduce one of the most common format in the optical gas sensor is calling the non-dispersive infrared gas sensors. So it's operate in the infrared range, near infrared, mid infrared, or even far infrared. Because optical gas sensor itself, you know, it can actually can induce a really complicated setup instruments that cost around hundred thousand US dollars per setup to get in a precise measurement. But for the NDIR gas sensors, it only costs roughly around two to 200 to 500 US dollars each. Still expensive, very, still very expensive, but this is the most cost effective in the category of the optical gas sensor. So how it works. So let's look at this um, spectrum here. So you can see some of the gas, sense, the gas molecules here, you have the very unique absorptions in terms of the uh, optical wavelengths. So for instance, if we select one of the wave, one of the wavelengths here, for instance, we select the, um, uh, the number four here, uh, the four micrometers here. We can only detect the carbon dioxide rather than other gases. So this actually gives you a sort of fingerprint, you know, uh, for the gas detection, just based on the optical intensity change at that particular wavelength. And another thing is, because this is no chemistry involved, it's purely based on the physical properties. So it, that means this sensor's selectivity is really, really high. Yeah, I'm not saying it's, it's like it's uh, have a really super selectivity, but you have the selectivity, much better selectivity compared with the chemical reactions based gas sensor that later on I will talk about it um, later on. Yeah. Uh, the fundamentals is very simple. It only consists of a light source, optical detectors, and a, um, and a interaction cell but it does cost because the cost normally come from the detectors. So it costs like three to four, 300 to four, 500 US dollars. So light source, yeah, it can be a broadband source to try to reduce the cost, but you can use a narrow band source as well to you know, try to increase the sensitivity and accuracy, but this increase the cost as well. And the cell, it can be either free space or it can get in that interesting cell embedded into the waveguide. So this actually make it a huge difference because a free space, you need a certain interaction lens um, to induce the sensitivity of the sensors. So some of the pretty interesting sensors you can see in the market is they have used a really long tube. They consist 10 meters, a 10 meter tube as an interaction tubes there. So now have, there's a really interesting trend is people trying to minimize the optical gas sensors and they use a waveguide here because the waveguide, it had, it, it confined the light interaction into a very tiny space and you have the very high quality factors. So that means 
we think that very small scale, physical scale, it has the very long effective optical lens. But at the same time, waveguide is very expensive to fabricate it. You have to use the really high class clean room to try to realize the miniature waveguide. So in that case, it also increased the cost dramatically at the same time. So this is actually is a conflict at the moment. And apparently there's no uh, commercial miniature uh, optical gas sensor at this moment yet. Okay, the second category of the optical properties-based gas sensors I would like to teach you is a much low cost uh, approach. It's called a thermal conductivity gas sensors. So as you, you can see from this graph, yeah, we can see um, at different temperature, we have a different curve for different gases. This is about the thermal conductivity. Yeah, that means different gas, they have the different thermal absorptions and emissions. So based on that, we can try to distinguish among different gas molecules. Um, they can distinguish between the magnitudes and also from the slope. But in the commercial sensors, like this one, they only use the magnitude at this moment because the slope is much more um, dif difficult to, um, to observe because you have the multiple elements to embed that into these uh, small sensors here. So you can see, you know, we only apply the heat. Yeah, it's just like resistance. So it's much more, much more low cost than the, um, than the optical gas sensor that I mentioned uh, just now. But another thing is because the thermal conductivity you can see is in the very tiny uh, range, for instance, refer to the air, you only have the eight times la larger than the air. So the magnitude is very tiny. So you have to use a really sophisticated electronic circuit to try to make the signal that acceptable by the conventional instruments. Um, yeah, as I say, it's very simple, light resistor. So you're getting a two resistor only uh, for this type of uh, gas sensors here. Yeah, actually you can use MEMS as well. There's only a few companies that can produce the MEMS-based thermal conductivity gas sensor at this moment. Yeah, it's not difficult actually, but the thing is, it's just uh, even you integrated those kind of uh, the, uh, the outlets into the, um, the MAM substrate, it's gonna be induced some of the problem, uh, but because of time constraint, I didn't, I, I, I will not uh, explain this in detail, but ideally speaking, you should have two elements that in the sensor, one is used as a sensitive element, the other used as the reference element. The sensitive element is detected gas, and the reference elements try to exclude the effects of the pressure change, temperature change, and humidity change. Okay, after introducing the uh, physical property-based gas sensors, I'm gonna talk about a little bit about the electrochemical gas sensor. Actually, this is what you guys are interested in maybe and what you guys have the expertise in. So electrochemical sensor actually counting 45% of the gas sensor um, used in the market. So it's a very huge category. It's because it has a very low cost. So simply, it's just a, um, it's just a electrochemical cell, you know, consists of the electrolyte yeah, and two electrodes here. And to try to save the cost, people also using that one of the electrode as a catalyst that put in the noble metal into a PDFE tapes. Yeah, it's not a even not a wire, yeah, it's, a, it's just a PDFE tapes. So this cost this reducing the cost to be less than actually less than 50 US dollars each. Yeah, for the uh, for the uh, massive manufacturers. Uh, so actually there's a hose there, yeah. So you can control the the the, the gas diffusion rate into the Electrodes here, yeah. So you can control the size here, yeah. But you can't make it too large, definitely, because if you make it too large, uh, there's lots of contamination going to be increased here. Yeah. Okay, so when the gas absorbed in the electron light and you are um, making a, uh, for instance, a CV curve, so you, you will apparently you will see in the reduction and oxidation peaks. So in practice, because we, we don't have the, such a complicated electronics to get in a complete CV scan. So we just select uh, one of the voltage, yeah, right in the reduction peaks here. And then we select the voltage and just monitoring output current, that's all. So nowadays with the electrolyte types, the liquid and solids, they have the sulfate ions, definitely. For liquid, normally people use sulfate acid. And for the solid, they use the sodium, so, uh, the sodium uh, sulfate. For the catalyst types, um, normally speaking, people use the platinum and yeah, there's a, a gold is another conventional approach to use. And for the NO, we can use a carbon or gold. Yeah, you can see it's very simple here. 
there's another problem, you know, because for gas sensors, the application temperature ranges, you know, is very right. And you can see this electrolyte, you know, for instance, if you have the less than 25, uh, minus 25 degrees, it's getting a frozen. So your, your sensor really can't, could not operate in that range. And if you achieving the, the melting point that above the sodium sulfate, for instance, 250 degrees, your sensor could not be worked well. So there's a very high limitations here. And also the second thing is, is a catalytic reactions. Yeah, so the gas molecule, they might have very similar reduction peak around the range. So for instance, the very uh, simple one is about the hydrogen and hydrogen sulfide. Yeah, they also have the very similar reduction peak that have the gap just less than one millivolt. So you detect hydrogen or hydrogen sulfide, you know, who knows? So the crosstalk or the selectivity of the electrochemical gas sensors is not as great as the physical property, um, those based on the physical properties. The second types of the um, um, chemical reaction based gas sensors is about the catalytic combustions. So instead of using the electrochemical cells, so we use a very conventional chemical catalyst to catalyze the target gas molecule at high temperatures, yeah? So this one is much more simple, definitely. You just need a platinum wire here as a heater. And then you call with a slurry, yeah? A slurry that consists of the uh, alumina, for instance, a very typical uh, high temperature catalyst in the industry, yeah? And the alumina, if, if you want to you know, accelerate the, the reactions, you can coat it with some of the metal catalysts there. But the metal catalyst, definitely the concentration is gonna be as minimum as possible because that will increase the cost as well. So in this case, these gas sensors, yeah, it's also no, no cost. It's only cost less than 100 US dollars as well because it's a very simple construction, right? The most costly elements here is about the pattern wires, yeah? So it costs slightly higher than electrochemical sensor because electrochemical sensor, you can just use a PTFE tape coat with the platinum. But here you have to use a platinum wire. So as the chemical reaction you know, occur, typically oxidation of the combustion gas, you, com you oxidize the hydrogen into water, you oxidize, for instance, the methane into carbon dioxide, right? You're gonna have the temperature change because those catalytic reaction is um, it can release um, the temperatures, yeah. So once you change the temperatures, the whole um, uh, very similar to the thermal conductivity gas sensor up there, right? So your the resistance of your platinum coil gonna be changed. So once you detect those change, you get in the gas sensor outputs. Um, temperatures, normally speaking, in the industry have to be more than five hundred degrees. Yeah, this graph is about using the nano material, so you can significantly reduce less than three hundred degrees, but still, it's much more than two hundred degrees. Yeah, the slurry material, I did speaking, you have to use an alumina, but some of the research recently found that cobalt oxide. Yeah, cobalt oxide is a much more better category, uh, the catalyst material than uh, alumina. And for the metal catalyst, you can use a platinum, palladium, gold. This is all the noble metals counterparts here. Okay, the final category I would like to emphasize here is about the semiconductor gas sensors. And I will say this is the cheapest gas sensors uh, types in the market. It only costs less than 10 US dollars. Yeah, or sometimes it's even less than one US dollars depending on the quality that you fabricate it. Yeah. So this sensor is, um, um, it uses semiconductors, yeah, as a sensitive material, yeah, not un unlike, unlike the electrochemical sensor used in the noble metals, yeah, the combustion types gas sensor using noble metal as well, yeah, but this one purely using the semiconductors, yeah. So because back in 1983, people found that you know absorption of the gas molecule on the surface of the semiconductors can really induce a catalytic reaction of the gas molecule at a much lower temperatures, for instance, 200 degrees, it's not necessary to be as high as 500 degrees there. Okay, so um, it's a catalytic reaction again, yeah? So you can see um, it's gonna, uh, it gonna be low cost and need some temperatures definitely. But the thing is for these semiconductor gas sensors, right? You have a lot of crosstalk, you know? For instance, humidity is one of the, the killers for the performance of the semiconductor gas sensors. So you can see if you use a lower uh, lower quality, 
yeah, you're gonna get in lots of interference there. If you use an optical gas sensors that worth 50 times larger than the uh, semiconductor gas sensor, you don't have such effects at all. So, so far, the sensitive material for the semiconductor gas sensors are mainly focused on metal oxides. For instance, zinc oxide, titanium oxide, tungsten oxide, and tin oxides, right? Especially tin oxide. That's in calculating more than 98% of the commercial available semiconductor gas sensor in the market. Operating temperatures, 200 degrees, is much lower than, um, uh, than the combustion types uh, gas sensors, definitely, yeah, which is about 500 degrees. And the heater, we don't need to use a pattern wire, right? We just use that ceramic tubes because we don't need that high temperatures uh, to reduce the reactions. So as some ceramic tubes with the capacity of up to 400 degrees, it's much more enough. So the interactions there, I would like to you know, try to give him an extra slide to talk about the, inter uh, the interactions because later on, the, I will gonna introduce some of the the work that we have to carry to try to solve the problem of the semiconductor gas sensor at this moment. It's about the innovations of the interactions uh, mechanisms. So for the conventional uh, interaction mechanism for semiconductor gas sensors, particularly metal oxide, it have to use the chemist swap oxygens on the surface of the metal oxides because metal oxide ideally is very favorable to absorb oxygen on the surface due to the presence of oxygen vacancy. So you can see at high temperatures, the oxygen will absorb on the surface of the metal, metal oxides. And then when you have the reduction gas, you know, for instance here, so that absorb oxygen will act as a catalyst to oxidize the reduction gases and produce electrons here. So in that case, you will, in, you will have the uh, resistance of the metal oxide decrease. So you can see, okay, if I have the resistance decrease, I will know we have the target gas molecule presence. And for the oxidating gas, it's gonna be the same. So oxidating gas, you're getting using the oxygen, uh, oxygen, oxygen to try to move in the oxidation state of the oxidating gas above. So in this case, it's drawing the electrons there. So in this case, the resistance of the material will increase in the presence of the oxidating gas. So this is presenting an opposite uh, interaction mechanism for the metal oxides here. So you can see everything is purely based on the chemical oxy oxygen interactions. So that will make it very really hard to discriminate between different target gas, especially with the reductions or oxidation properties. So the selectivity of the semiconductor gas sensor is the worst amount all the category that I introduced just now. But it's very tentative because it's low cost. You can use as, as little as one US dollars to try to induce the effect. Okay, so um, there's a one chance here is people try to, you know, to lower the cost of the semiconductor gas sensor. They use the MAM substrates here. Yeah, the MAMS is stand for the, um, the micro, uh, the, sorry, the micro, uh, electromechanical systems there to try to lower the temperatures, uh, the powers that are uh, induced into the system to, to, you know, for instance, 200 degrees conventional, you have to use, for instance, 10 milliwatt powers. But now use the MAM substrate, you can reduce to one milliwatt. Yeah, but the thing is, they're still using a tin oxide there. Yeah, you use a tin oxide, you will never solve the selectivity issue. Yeah, so this is one of the mistakes that currently in the industry at the moment, but we can wait for steps, you know, possibly in the new generations that we're gonna use the different types of material rather than the metal oxide to try to induce um, the solution for the, uh, the poor selectivity encountered by the semiconductor gas sensors. Okay, so we have the bright future for semiconductor gas sensors, right? But there's a lot of problems. So how can we do it? So as a um, <laughs> researcher, particularly in the gas sensor field for more than 12 years. So we thinking, okay, just now we based on the chemical structures, right? But why not we just directly use the physical structures? So physical structures without the enrollment of the absorbed oxygen, purely based on the direct interaction between the gas molecule and the sensitive materials. So in that case, we can, have, we can make the sensor operate ideally at room temperatures and increase the selectivity at the same time. 
fixed options have been here, you know, for more than 70 years for the, uh, for the history. Here. But the thing is, people never realize the fixed options can be used for gas sensors. It's because the fixed instruction only changes the ready surface properties of the material, but not the bulk property of the material until the emerging of the two-dimensional materials. So two-dimensional material is only have the thickness about single or few atomic layers. So in this case, the surface property dominate the bulk properties of the materials. So this gives you the fundamental for to reuse the instructions into the practical gas sensors. Um, some of the problems definitely are not the first one to discover that, you know, you know by, the, um, uh, by the few groups, particularly working in graphene, they already been used the graphene for the gas sensors back in 2006, this way before I start my PhD. But that problem is for the graphene, yeah, we can have the room temperatures gas sensing and have the very nice selectivity. But the thing is, it can't be recovered at all. So you only can use it as a gas detector, but not the gas sensors. So in this case, we tackled this problem back in 2014 and we found that, okay, why not we use a, another group of 2D material called the post-transition metal carcotinized with the strong electronegativity on the surface. So in this case, you have the balance between the absorption of the gas molecule and the desorption of the gas molecule to try to induce an reversible gas sensors based on the physics instructions. Yeah, so this is uh, the first group of material we try is tin disulfide, yeah, which is the brother huh, of the tin oxide, which is the most common use in the semiconductor gas sensors. So we're trying the tin disulfide here. Uh, tin disulfide, yeah, is a, is a layer material that can make it into 2D materials. So make it a, um, a five layers, uh, two-dimensional two tin disulfide here. Yeah, this is capitalization, but I'm not going through in details. So now interesting thing is about the response. Okay, so we could not achieve in at room temperature. I, I, um, I must uh, admit that, but the thing is we change the temperatures from about 200 degrees to lower to 120 degrees for a complete reversible response. And this is for the NO2 gas as one of the examples. And the selectivity here, you can see, we have the superior selectivity compared with those of metal oxides. We have them more than 30 times larger than other gases. So this is a very unique nitrogen dioxide sensors. And another thing is, unlike the humidity influenced by the metal oxide gas sensors available in the market, because it's based on the direct interactions. So the surface of the tin disulfide does not favorable to absorb the, high, uh, the water molecules there. So it has the very minimum humidity influence there. So in this case, we get in the first proof concept of the complete reversible physics option by gas sensors, just based on a two, di two dimensional tin disulfide here. But the, the, the definitely the first work gonna be criticized by lots of people. So we have to really, we have to be very careful to try to use the fundamental calculations and also the experimental evidence to try to prove that this is really the physics instructions. It's not about the enrollment of the absorbed oxygen effect on the surface of the two-dimensional tin, tin disulfides here. Just now, we get in the uh, tin disulfides for lowering the temperature from 200 degrees to 120 degrees, right? And also we increase the selectivity a lot, but our eventual, our eventual goal is to just put it at room temperatures. So I think room temperature is the most cost-saving, energy-saving approach, ideally for the internet of things. Yeah, because you, you can imagine if you're using the gas sensors, right? If you want to put into the IoT system, which is powered by battery, yeah? If you operate about 200 degrees, your battery will be drained significantly, possibly only last for days. And some, something that you want to last for months, right? So room temperature is the most easy um, approach or practical approach for that. So that's why we have to target on the room temperature approach. So we, we get in another brothers of tin disulfide. We use a tin monosulfide here. Tin monosulfide is also a layer materials that can make it to 2D materials. Yeah, even though the crystal structure is a, a, a slightly different. Yeah, but the thing is we can make it to um, also five layer thick. Yeah, five layer thick, very similar to those of the tin disulfide. 
So five layer thick, normal speaking, is around three nanometers to four nanometers around that range. Yeah. So it's really thin. Um, an interesting property there I can see is about the uh, exciting excitation wavelength dependent for photoluminescence there. So it's very similar to the quantum dots effects here. So this actually is give us a idea to further lowering the operation temperatures. Yeah, later on I will show that how we're gonna lower them. Okay, so there's a story there. We use the material tin, di tin monosulfide as a sensitive material to try to test the gas at room temperatures. Yeah, it does have the very nice response, but the thing is, it's similar to graphene, it never recover. So this gives us a, something that, you know, how can we really induce the reversibilities there? And we think about, okay, you have the, um, the very nice uh, excitation wavelength dependent photoluminescence. That means you have a very strong excitonic interactions. So in this case, we apply the light. So we induce the first optoelectronic gas sensors here. So instead of heating up the temp, heating up the sensors, we apply the light shining into the sensors to try to induce the exciton and let the exciton to interact with the, uh, the gas molecule or salt on the surface of the materials. Uh, definitely you can see at room temperature, yeah, we can have a little bit response there, but the, the maximum, maximum response happen at 60 degrees. Yeah, and with the full recover, definitely. And, but the response time and recovery time, the response time is nice, recovery time is a bit longer. This is a very typical room temperature gas sensing features. And the selectivity, you can see, it's much better than the tin um, disulfide when we're using the light excitations. So in this case, we further lower the 120 degrees to 60 degrees, yeah, for the optimum gas sensing response. And we use the white lights, yeah, very low power, power white lights there. So in this case, because there's lots of system, IoT system, they have the lights, the LED lights there. So we can use that light to be embedded into the optoelectronic gas sensors here, you know, to, to try to further reduce the uh, power consumptions. Okay, so 60 degrees, we still have a 35 degrees approach to room temperatures. So we further explore other alternative material to try to induce the complete room temperatures gas sensing with the full reversibilities. So we look at an another element next to tin, which is the indium. So indium have a very, uh, it's a very strange, um, you know, uh, crystal structures here. So you can see you have the very interesting um, Oxygen wave, uh, so the self, uh, the indium wave can sit there. Yeah. So once you have the indium wave can sit, that means it can absorb, it can act in as the active centers to particularly absorb the gas molecules. Uh, so we use uh, some of the method to try to uh, produce the atomically thin indium oxides. Uh, so in uh, the indium sulfide, uh, because in the, uh, in the conventional hydrothermal um, reaction or other reaction, you could not make it the indium sulfide less than 10 nanometers. Yeah. And yes, we are only for using the 2D material, we have to make it as thin as possible. So make it to be around three nanometers here. Yeah. And um, yeah, you can see the, the size is very really huge. The, the 2D materials cover up the field. So we have the, some of the very interesting features there. Uh, this is the simulation about you know, how we using the uh, dose of the indium vacancy as a channel, a conduction channels, yeah? So if you get in the gas interactions in, along the indium channels, you're gonna have a very significant and sensitive response toward the target gas molecules. Okay, but the thing is, um, indium sulfide, you can see is very nice structure, but the problem is um, those indium defects it's very strong. It trapped the gas molecule like those of graphene. So it could not induce the, it was the full reversibilities. So in this case, we slightly modify the surface of indium sulfide into a indium um, oxysulfide there. So we get in a little bit of oxygen, replace the sulfide, you know, to make it the indium sulfide into a HANA structure that consists of a indium oxysulfide and indium sulfide. In, in the single 2D material form. So the idea is um, 
is very simple, right? So we try to use an indium oxysulfide to significantly manipulate the surface distortion and absorption energy to the gas molecules. So this is a very basic characterization. I will not go through in details here. Um, yeah, so this is the morphologies and um, um, the things that's showing here is about the um, excitonic interaction that very similar to the uh, tin monosulfide. Yeah, so we can see this group of uh, post-transition metal carcogenides. It has a really unique excitonic interaction. So later on, our gas sensor also based on the auto-electronic gas sensing uh, platform and see how the lights completely replace the heat. Uh, one thing I would like to uh, talk about here is about the excitonic interaction lifetime. So compare with the pure indium sulfide and the tin monosulfide, the excitation lifetime is more than two order long. So in this case, we can expect the sensitivity of the gas sensing could be enhanced greatly compared with the result that I present uh, in the previous slide. Okay, so this is the um, evidence of all the field structures. Yeah, so again, we proved that even though the oxygen introduced into the um, surface of the indium sulfide, the field structure is still dominated. Yeah. Okay, now the interesting thing is, is here. Yeah, it's about a room temperature um, gas sensors. We're only using a low power LED, a blue light LED, yeah, that normally exists in the IoT system. One thing that I would like to say here is about the detection limit. So this is the first report for the um, room temperature fully reversible gas sensors with the limit of detection to be less than one ppb of NO2 gases. So it's only 0.676. So this given that is one of the most accurate um, NO2 gas sensors available in the research. Yeah, definitely not the commercial one because they have a very long way to translate into commercial, uh, the, uh, the commercializations. The time, the lifetime, uh, I mean, the response time is a bit long, definitely, but this does not really matter for IoT system because we are not targeted into the industry productions, but only the household applications. Selectivity, yeah, the selectivity is, yeah, even though it's not 30 times larger than that, but this is because the response factors is a bit in decrease because it's not operate at the elevated temperatures. It only operate at room temperature, but still is superior compared to other commonly, gas, uh, commonly seen gas available in the industry. Okay, so we, this is only a showcase about how we explore alternative to overcome the problem of the semi uh gas sensors there. Yeah. So those of the research, we hopefully we would like to translate into the practical applications. Um, so this is a really, um, this is a really standard um, process, you know, to how we um, deposit the material, the sensitive material into the substrate and then getting the substrate integrated into the SMT package. Yeah, but actually we have the, uh, we have the uh, complete packaging, I mean the fabrication and packaging uh, production line, a very small scale production line available in Australia. This is getting one of the translation pathway into the industry. But the, but the thing is in Australia, people doesn't really think environmental pollution is one of the key factors. Yeah, it's because Australia is purely based on the first, the first category and the third category industry. So which is the agriculture, mining, and also servicing. So it have a really minimum industry activities. There. So this give us the translation of the gas sensors into the industry, a very big hard hurdles. So what, what we're gonna do? Because Australian government is very interested in the health. So we have no choice to translate the gas sensors into the health applications. So next one is about a given the last session, we given about a translation examples. See how we use the gas sensors to detect the, helmet, the human being's health. So we targeted on a, one of the very common 
uh, problem in the human body is about the is a gut disorders. Yeah, there's a very um, academic word here is a gastrointestinal. We, we use a gut as a uh, as a simple word. Yeah, so people have the gut problem disorder problem. Yeah, worldwide, especially in the developed countries. Yeah, one in five, or even two in five population, they have the gut disorders in the developed countries. Is because their diets, yeah, because their unhealthy diets. Yeah, but for developing for developing country, it's a bit better because because the 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 food processing degrees is not as high as those of the developed countries. So, for the gut disorders. Normally speaking, it's causing by some of the unknown effect because the gut is inside the body. It's difficult to use the instrument to be merged into the gut to detect what kind of problem it is. So, so far, people use the imagine that, so use the imaging system. The imaging system only can see the appearance, but not the inside the physiological effect. So one of the one of the potential biomarkers to investigate those physiological effects is about a gas. So on here, I only give a few examples about how the gas, you know, correlates into the physiological functions of the guts. Yeah. So for instance, um, when you digest the, carb uh, the carbon hydrates, right? So with the bacteria, you will break it into the short chain fatty acid, which is a, is a very typical uh, volatile organic compound. And also by some of the, uh, the reaction pathway, we can break it into hydrogen and carbon dioxide as well. And with the, you know, for instance, if the, um, this is a sulfur reduction bacterials, we can reduce the hydrogen into hydrogen sulfide. With the methane bacterials, you can convert the hydrogen and carbon dioxide into methane. So ideally speaking, the human body is, itself is a huge production machine. For the gas, yeah, because it's have the variety of the bacteria, the wires, you know, and all the micro the microorganisms inside, yeah. So it produces the gas every second. Okay, so we have the idea that why not we get in the gas sensors to monitoring the gas emitted inside the body, not from the breath, because the breath you get in lots of dilution already, you know, from the lung, from your thoughts, yeah. Not for the fat as well, because the fat only represent the gas concentration with the rectal regions, a very small section for the intestine. Yeah. So we get in the gas sensors, hopefully to, more, more, to measure the gas concentration, the type of gas inside the bodies. So ideas come and we get in the, the idea of the capsules. Yeah, because this is come from the capsule for the um, the camera capsules, yeah. Camera capsules, you swallow it and look in all the uh, image of your gut. And why not we replace the camera with the gas sensors? This is what the ideas come from. And um, definitely uh, it's not that easy to put in the gas sensor inside the capsule. First thing first, we can't use the conventional metal oxide based semiconducting gas sensor because the power is the, the power is, is too power hungry, yeah? The battery will drain in less than 12 hours. So it's meaningless, yeah? The second one is we have to stop the liquid from the gut, diffuse into the gas, uh, diffuse into the capsule to destroy the electronics. But at the same time, we have to allow the gas molecule to, to pass because, uh, you know, we need to detect the target gas molecule in the gut. So in this case, uh, first thing first, we use our develop um, the physiosorption gas sensors to place the metal oxides to in reduce the power consumptions. And at the same time, we increase the selectivity of the gas molecules. And second one is we use a gas permeable membranes yeah, to really you know, get in the whole drill through the capsule and seal it the whole. So in this case, for the gas permeable membranes, if the pore size less than five angstrom, it will stop the liquid to diffuse in because the water molecules itself, you know, you have the, in, normally speaking, you have the more than 10 nanometers diameters, but for the gas molecule, you have them one, less than one nanometers. 
So in this case, we have to get getting the water and gas separations. Uh, we have very strong electronic background. We're getting the you know the apps, the receiver that all built by ourselves. Yeah, so in 2014, the first year that we developed the feed suction uh, gas sensors, we straight to be used in the gas capsules and then to put it in the um, in the animal trial to see if our capsule works. And um, yeah, you can see because we select the pigs here, the gas pit have the very similar um, digest system uh, compared with human beings. So they're very similar. So we use a pig and then we uh, you know, force the pig to swallow the capsules and use a lot of force. And then we um, compare with the dissection results straight after the, fin uh, the termination of the experiments. So we can see even though the, um, the concentrations are different yeah, because the dissections uh, is a ex situ measurement yeah? and the capsule is an in situ measurement. So concentration you can see is, um, is very different, definitely. Uh, but the thing is we have a very similar chain. So we let the pig to have the high fiber diets and the low fiber, low fiber diets and low fiber, uh, those type of different types of diet will induce the different gas emissions. And uh, we actually, we seen um, different gas emission profiles here uh, uh, for the whole uh, transition period of the capsule from the mouth to the stomach, small intestine, large intestine, rectum, and then release from the body. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is a collaboration with the University of Melbourne uh, back in seven years ago. And uh, we actually have a few very nice publication uh, publish, and because I've come from a really electronics and material engineering background, yeah, I, I have no choice to write in the medical journals. Yeah, for instance, transient biotechnologies and scientific report that regarding on the, the animal study and the uh, the medical study. Yeah, but we we do overcome that. And uh, after we try that in um, oh, fifty six pigs, yeah, this lasts for a year. Yeah, almost. And then we finally convinced the um, Australian health authorities and the ethic committees for a few uh, prestige hospitals. Uh, so in 2016, we obtained the ethic approvals to be trialed in uh, healthy human beings. Uh, so um, in this year, in, in that year, right, between 2016 and 2017, we accrued 24 healthy human volunteers. And then we are, we are very excited at the time because we, this is the first time for us to explore the gas profile in, inside the human body, right? Uh, so we have lots of um, a comparative study. You know? The first comparative study here is about the, the, gut, uh, the gut motilities. So it, just, it, it means how fast your food it transit along your guts. So here we have the oxygen sensors embedded into the gas capsules. Uh, so based on the gas, the oxygen profile, we can see in the stomach, yeah, it have the very um, from the twenty percent of oxygens, yeah, rapidly increased to sixty something percent oxygens there. This is not fully oxygens, yeah, we call it oxygen equivalent. That means it's all the oxidating gas, like the active oxygen species and some of the um, nitro oxide active species along the stomach. And then when you pass the small intestine, which consists of the jejunium and ileum, the gas molecule, uh, sorry, at the gas concentration, oxygen gas concentration start to decrease. And then up in the column, which is called the large intestine, it reach almost 0% of the oxygen there. And each positions, we get in the um, a um, MRI um, imaging um, there for a volunteer to sit in the hospital for um, twelve hours. So each position, we prove that okay, this is a different area for the different um, gas concentrations. So based on the result here, we actually we publish. Um, a paper in the first issue of Nature Electronics yeah, regarding on the, um, on the exploration of the human gas, po gas profile 
with a um, capsules, yeah, with the gas sensor capsules. And then the, the second comparative study here is about the breath test. Yeah, because the breath test is the most conven conventional testing approach in addition to the, um, um, for instance, the capsules. Yeah. yeah, because you just measure the exhale breath and it's nice and simple. Uh, so for that uh, breath test, normally people will, um, will get in the inulin um, intolerance, uh, which is a gut disorder there. Uh, so we get in the, we make it the volunteer to take the inulin and the glucose yeah, to try to do a comparison with the capsules results. And you can see the trend, that they're very simple. And the, I'm sorry, not simple. They're very similar, but the concentration. Yeah. So here is in percentage and here is in the PPM for the breath test. So that means we have the sensitivity enhanced more than 1000 times from the in-situ measurement from the bodies. So based on the two measurement results, we get in a spin out company back in 2018 um, to try to commercialize the gas capsules. And uh, so now after four years, right? So they will go to the, uh, um, the IPO, the, the IPO uh, listing and they go through the C cycle uh, venture capital rising for 10, 10 million Australian dollars. So which equals to almost 8.5 million uh, US dollars. Uh, hopefully we will see the products eventually in the market in 2025. Okay, so in, um, in conclusions, uh, we introduced um, different types of gas sensors um, from the fundamental to their configurations, uh, compare with their cost performance um, and other advantage and disadvantage. And, you know, we, we get in a, general pictures of gas sensors and lots of attention is paid into the semiconductor gas sensors because it's the cheapest gas sensor available in the market. So we have the lots of room to try to improve. Yeah, so one of the problem is the selectivity and the power consumptions, but we can replace the conventional metal oxide using the two-dimensional ultra-think nanomaterials. Yeah, it's because we completely um, get rid of the chemist options interaction mechanism. We use a much lower power demanding physical instructions interaction mechanisms in the two dimensional nanomaterials. Um, we showcase, yeah, we use, uh, you know, uh, the health, human health um, as a, one of the showcase. Uh, we also have some of the little demonstrations regarding on the uh, environmental agriculture demonstrations, yeah but because of time issues, right? So I'm not talking that those in detail, but yeah, because we are gonna establish uh, long-term collaborations. So this is gonna be a time matters that we're gonna, you know, get in those stories, store out and, you know, we will exchange. And finally, um, the 2D material construction gas sensors, even though we have the very scale, small scale trans uh, translation into industry, but it's still lots of fundamental that we have to understand. And uh, you can see uh, actually there's um, the numbers of paper published regarding uh, two-dimensional material-based gas sensors is rapidly increased uh, after the first paper emerging uh, for the construction based um, tin disulfide um, gas sensors in 2015. Yeah, so you can see every year we have more than 250 paper published related to this area. So I, I, I'm sure that there are lots of interesting and powerful material gonna be exploited and getting, making the advance, advancement for the gas sensor development suitable for, um, for example, IoT and other low power applications. Okay, that's all. And uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me a chance to introduce uh, the basics for the gas sensors and uh, some of the recent activity that we have carried on on the research of gas sensors. Thank you so much. I welcome any questions. Okay, yes. So um, uh, yeah, interesting question for the fire alarm, which is, uh, I think that's one of the sensors that uh, we see in the everyday life. Uh, so there's always a, uh, a um, disconnection between the research and the uh, practical applications there, because uh, in the research, we're trying to achieve um, accurate, more accurate, more sensitive, 
and more perfect solutions. But in the practical uh, applications, for instance, fire alarms. So fire alarms normally happen in the uh, the the cause of fires. For instance, in the kitchens, yeah, it's no, normally it's because of the uh, carelessness of the of the users, right? So for instance, you leave the pan to burn for too long, and then suddenly those fires come out, yeah. And the fire alarm itself is actually is a detector to detect the particle matters. So it's a PM, which is solid. It's is is you know the because the cost is an issue. So for instance, we can get in a gas array, yeah, to see okay, we can analyze for those of the causing the fire. We have the carbon dioxide, yeah, because when you uh, boil something, right, the the water might make it the fires gone and but the gas is still released so this is the release of the carbon dioxide or the carbon uh the hydrocarbons right or the burning of the gas is not complete and it, it emit lots of carbon monoxide there which is toxic to human body or you get the leakage of the pipe they're causing the fires you know those are kind of things is we can definitely measure that uh, without any problem but the thing is in the practice um, those costs is very expensive. You can see, you know, for instance, we use the cheapest semiconductor gas sensor as examples. If you're going to get in, you, if you want to measure the carbon monoxide, uh, hydrocarbon, methane, these three gases, you need at least three to four gas sensors, you know, to try to com construct into an array. But that will make it your alarm to be possibly 50 US dollars. Yeah, 50, 40 to 50 dollars, US dollars. But the thing is, you know, we can't afford it in the household. Yeah, because those alarms or the gas sensor array, it, it may last only for a month or years, maybe one or two years. And, you know, every year you have to spend, you know, 40, 50 US dollars. It's not that worth it, definitely. So, what the industry people do is no matter what, right? Everything costs the fires, we assuming. This is the dangers. So the fire normally will cause the particle matters detections. So for instance, you're getting lots of small solid particles that diffuse into that. So simply, they use a LED with the photo detectors. So if your particle, the solid particle concentration is blocking the optical pass between the LED and the photo detectors, it will trigger the alarm. Yeah, so this is, um, out of the scope of the gas sensor. But on the other hand, you can see there's a loss of, um, um, there's a loss of products in the market claim that, okay, this is a carbon monoxide gas sensor yeah, alarm to try to prevent because sometimes you can't see the fires, right? You will see, you know, you can't smell for the carbon dioxide, uh, monoxide. Yeah? Even though people adding some of the smelling gases into the, uh, for instance, gas pipe, but sometimes you can't smell, especially for those without attention. So in this case, they will use a very simple same kind of gas sensors that cost less than 10 US dollars or even cheaper, you know? So everything that showing with the, everything that's showing with the change of the resistance of the sensor, it will trigger the alarm significantly. So this like what you say, uh, Professor Ethan, so you have the loss of false alarm, but those false alarms actually, no matter it's false or true, you will get in some of the, you know, some of the notice, you know, to the to the people. So, yeah. So that's that's why there's a gaps that if we get in loss of um, much more accurate sensor arrays into the practice, we have to significantly lower the price of the gas sensors. We might get in one gas sensors less than 10 cents of US dollars to try to make more people afford to get in their accurate reflections. So you can see lots of novel gas sensor application is actually focused on the high values application area, for example, health, which is the high value add area that with lots of profit, lots of margin that can afford by certain group of people. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I can see. Jen. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Uh, now we have, yeah, Dr. Jian Liu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. please. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks to, to Prof. O. Oh, yeah. Very comprehensive introduction with uh, like a gas sensor. I'm a student in this area, but actually I have some like a simple question about uh, your encapsule sensor. It's very interesting and very useful for medical application. Uh, because of this kind of sensor, you need to use it at very low temperature, right? Normally like a human body temperature. So is there any like uh, limited categories of gas you can sense? Like uh, how many types of gas you can sense inside a human body? Yeah, uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Lu. Yeah, definitely. There's a very limited gas molecule. Um, types can be detected um, based on the, the very limited category of material that used uh, for the physiological gas sensing at this moment. Yeah, because you can see um, for the majority gas molecule types, we can only sense in the uh, NO2, uh, hydrogen, okay. and methane, and also hydrogen sulfides, uh, ammonium, these kind of things. Yeah, there's actually the environment inside the human body is much more complicated, especially there's a huge amount of VOC, the volatile yeah. organic compounds there. So in this case, there might be a couple of solutions there. So the first solution is like what Professor Ethan said, a sensor array. Yeah. So we induce, we induce the low cost sensor array, right? So we make it 10 sensors or even 20 sensors with 20 different materials there. Yeah you know, to try to get in a minimized package and each of the elements is gonna be, you know, respond to, uh, have a very unique response to um, certain gases. So you have the 20 types of uh, materials. So you have the 20 unique gas response patterns and based on the, you know, signal processing and hybridizations, it might can solve, it might can detect, you know, um, increase the detection range of the gas molecules. But on the other hand is um, 20 materials, right? It's a very challenging task to be getting into a small package, definitely. I, I would say it's not, it's not impossible, it's possible, but there's another way maybe it can be, you know, try to improve. For instance, um, the optical um, gas sensors here. So optical gas sensor itself, we have the very unique features, but now the problem is um, the expensive cost of the waveguide, um, the expensive cost of the miniature source and the detectors, and the miniature source is not that available in the mid infrared range or the far infrared range. Yeah. yeah, but given this is the one of the most accurate method to try to uh, you know, detect a wide range of gas molecules, so another way it can be a innovations to try to minimize or try to produce the minimized package for the waveguide, for the LED, and for the uh, for the data all in there and with the proper photonic circuits. Yeah. So photonic circuit, you can say I can make 64 channels or 128 channels that in a very tiny one, yeah, without any problem. Because I think Dr. Uh, Lu already been quite familiar because you're you're in Singapore, right? Yeah, yeah. Lots of this kind of channel, AWS channels there. Yeah. So in this case, we can really make it those kind of um, detection um, possible. So the eventual question is, which approach is gonna be much, much more cost effective and which approach is gonna be more easily uptaken by the industry? Yes. Yeah. So it's an open question. Um, and also you can see the gas capsule itself is, um, is a long campaign. Yeah, it's a yeah. long campaign for that. Um, this is our dream, definitely. We can get in all the gas pieces inside the guts to be detected. But in the reality, we only can detect a very limited types of gas species. And, but those limited types of gas species can make a significant step in the medical research. Yeah. or in the health research already. So um, this is also the limit for the industry as well. You know, something that uh, chico a bit, you know, they feel very excited. They go ahead and they make it a very, very small step improvement. And with more resource and uh, the technology more advanced, they will move another right. steps. Yeah, so this is the, you know, we, we call it is the what? We call it is the, um, the harmonic cohesions. 
between the industry and the research, possibly. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. Uh, I, I saw your data, you compare with like uh, the uh, brace, right? The, mm -hmm. You know, right now, because of COVID, everyone wears a mask. So I see that the trend almost similar. So uh, is there any other like uh, uh, special uh, target is your big difference when you do the like calibration with the brace? Uh, for the breath is um, uh, there's another category is called uh, inratable, inratable bowel symptoms, which is called IBS. So IBS is a very yeah. similar types in the Western country, yeah, or developed countries. You know, one in ten people will have the IBS. They claim. Um, so there's one of the biomarkers that they claim is about the methane and hydrogen ratios from the breath. But the thing is, for the breath analysis, only have the accuracy of 60%. So it's just like the chance that higher than the toes of a coin. Yeah. Um, we do have the, uh, in the fourth clinical trial that happened in um, last year by the companies. So I look at the reports. So the breath, the ratios between the hydrogen and methane uh, I mean, the chain, right, for, for around 12 patients. So it's not a healthy warranty anymore for the patients. So they're getting the frustrated um, results from the breath. So this, this is because of the low accuracies of the breath analysis. But for the capsules, we can distinctly see the hydrogen levels of uh, the hydrogen levels over the methane level is significantly reduced from those IBS patients. So this might reflect that the methane is a quite effective biomarkers in the IBS patients. But again, this is only 12 patients uh, uh, data, so we can't make any solid con conclusion and it does not publish uh, in, the, in the scientific publication anyway. This is from the, uh, the letter to the investors. But this also tells that Breath analysis is a very limited, uh, with li limited accuracy. It only have a um, really little medical significance in most of the, um, the disease diagnosis. Yeah. Uh, so it is difficult to try to get in a direct comparison between the breath analysis and also the capsule results. Uh, maybe the one that we use a lot, uh, for instance, that uh, breath analysis for the inulin Intolerance is the most accurate one with more than 80% accuracy. So that's why we only put in yeah. that worth it for the scientific publications. Yeah, for, for the others, um, I don't think the academic community is going to accept that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, may, may I take the last question from the audience from online YouTube? Uh, just one last question. The, he, he or she asking about how about the effect of humidity on the performance of gas sensor at room temperature? Did you measure the effect of humidity on the gas sensor based on 2D materials? And uh, they ask, uh, do you think 2D material can help to reduce the effect of humidity? Basically, it's about humidity. Okay, yeah, that's a good question. So um, we do a comparison study first for metal oxide based chemical structures, um, gas sensors. So the reasons that the humidity play effect is about the oxygen or salt on the surface will catalyze the hydrogen, uh, will catalyze the water molecule in the metal oxide surface as well. So this causing a huge humidity interference in the metal oxide surface based on the chemical structures behavior. So for the 2D material, um, Physics interactions, interactions. Um, for instance, the um, metal cacogenides, most of the metal cacogenides that based on the physics structures is direct interactions between the gas molecule or the water molecule with the, uh, the sensitive materials itself. So it does not have any agents of a soft oxygen in the pathway. So this gives us a hint that the interaction is purely based on the absorption energy of the material toward the target gas molecule or the water molecules. And also they are band positions 
for instance, the connection band and the valence band position of the sensitive material and the homo and lomo orbitals positions of the water molecules or the gas molecule and how they pin in through the Fermi network pinning effects. So some of the group of the 2D materials, for instance, graphene, it have the humidity uh, sensing effect as well. But for some other material, for instance, tin disulfide, indium sulfide, and also tin monosulfide, it does not have the humidity effect on the, on the gas sensing performance it's because their surface is not favorable to absorb the water molecule on top. So that's why it's a, it's a general question that um, humidity is a sure effect in metal oxide based on chemical options at elevated temperatures, but it's not a surely effect in 2D material based fish options gas sensors. Yeah, some of the 2D material they're sensitive, but some 2D material they're not sensitive. It depends on the particular property of the material itself. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. And please feel free to, you know, um, email me and, you know, press an email through um, the Center of Excellence and Professor Ethipan for, for the questions. Yeah. Looking forward to visit the university physically sometimes this year or next year. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. See you then. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.